Well, today we're continuing our Lenten sermon series, Miserable Offenders, Rediscovering the Doctrine of Sin and the Mercies of God. I've mentioned before that the title comes from the language of the prayer book Confession, which we'll say in a few minutes, where we pray, O Lord, have mercy on us, miserable offenders. These two words we've said say a lot. They speak honestly to the miserable effect that sin has on our lives. It speaks to us as those who do it, those who are guilty of it. We are the offenders. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been working on the foundations of the biblical doctrine of sin. And I realize that doing a series like this seems a bit unusual in our day and age. It's not a conversation we're used to having or a topic that that people teach on a great deal. But I think that's to the detriment of the church. And I think it's a neglect of the gospel to ignore this type of teaching. The great Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle summed it up well when he said, the plain truth is that a right knowledge of sin lies at the root of all saving Christianity. So it's an important conversation to have. And during this 40-day season of Lent, where we take time to do some self-examination and contemplation of sin in our lives, it made sense and that seemed natural for us to take this time and talk about it. So over the last three weeks, we've looked at how the Bible addresses sin from its opening chapters and how the message of Jesus and the apostles begins with a call to repentance, to turn from sin and turn to God. Last week, we looked at the two aspects of sin, how sin works in us, in that internal nature that we inherit, and then in the external outworking of it in thought and word and in deed. And we finished last week, though, by reminding ourselves of the great solution for sin that is offered to us in Christ, Jesus who took sin on himself and redeemed us by his cross. But, But all that being said, there's a nagging question that many Christians ask. If Jesus died for my sin and has freed me from sins, my sins, why do I still struggle with sin so much? I asked that question for a long time myself and I really agonized over the fact that I didn't seem to be making much progress in my life of faith even after I was ordained. I felt like a failure Because I seemed to be losing more battles than I was winning. That's why I'm so grateful that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to record his own personal struggle. In our lesson this morning in chapter 7 of Romans, where he says, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. You can hear the, the frustration in his voice as he says those words. And every time I read this passage, it brings me a bit of peace because I feel like I'm not alone. And I'm not the only one who has had that experience. So if you struggle like I do or like St. Paul did, there is hope. There is really good news. For us, by continuing to dive into this discussion of the doctrine of sin and the mercies of God, and I pray that this sermon will encourage and strengthen you. So we're going to try to unpack the answer to the question, why do I still struggle with sin? To answer that, we need to lay some foundational work first. We have to begin with how faith in Christ and and our baptism were changed changed in who we are and in our relationship to sin, once we do that, then we can answer the question of why do we still struggle. You should have a sermon outline in your bulletins. I welcome you to follow along. Our starting point is union with Christ. Union with Christ. When we are frustrated by our inability to overcome sin in our life, our natural tendency is to try harder not to sin. We make these bargains with ourselves. We try to psych ourselves up. Oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. 
Maybe we punish ourselves in some way. Maybe we add to our religious efforts by reading more books, finding some new prayers, bargaining with God, my, doing more church work. But if you tried that, you know it doesn't work, does it? Not really. It's not too long before we find ourselves back in the same cycle of temptation, sin, guilt, shame, and then promising to work harder and not do it again. And the error we are making is that we think we can overcome sin ourselves by our own effort. If we just tried harder. But we can't start with us. We have to start with Jesus and His work and our relationship to Him. Last week, I talked a bit about our natural connection to Adam. We saw that sin entered the world through Adam, and that Adam's sin nature is then passed on to all humanity. So everyone inherits this this broken union with God, and is prone to rebellion and sin against God. That's our natural identity, or as St. Paul says in Ephesians, our identity apart from Christ. But when we come to faith in Christ and are baptized, something wonderful happens. No longer are we in union with Adam and his disobedience. We are now brought into union with Christ and his obedience. Our identity is changed. We are truly made a new creation in Christ. Romans 6, if you back up one chapter from where we were this morning, St. Paul says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is echoed in our baptismal liturgy. When we pray the blessing over the waters of baptism, we say, we thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. And through it we are made regenerate, made new, by the Holy Spirit. See, that's not just spiritual symbol. That's divine reality at work in us. The union with Christ means that we are freed from the burden of sin, the penalty of sin, and the punishment of sin. This union with Christ now forms the basis of a new identity. We are in Christ, united to him, adopted into his family, made members of his body, the church. Something amazing happens to us in our relationship to sin as well. and That's the second point. By faith in Christ, by baptism into Christ, the dominion of sin is broken. Christ's death on this cross and his subsequent resurrection writes what Adam's disobedience had wronged. As we are baptized into Christ and united to him, the absolute power of sin over us is broken. It is no longer king in our lives, and we are no longer bound to it or enslaved by it. Listen to how St. Paul puts it in Romans 6 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Before we come to Christ, sin reigns in us, sin's in the driver's seat. Steering wherever the world, the flesh, and the devil want to go. We are largely along for the ride at that point. But now we're people who've been liberated from the power and reign of sin. Sin is no longer in the driver's seat. But as we will see, sin remains quite the annoying backseat driver. Any discussion of our current struggle with sin must be rooted in an understanding of our union to Christ and his breaking of the power of sin which once ruled over us. By by faith and being baptized into Christ, 
We receive the grace, the benefits, the status, the change in identity that can only be described as being born again. So in that process, Christ shatters the chains of sin that once bound us. Sin no longer has dominion over us. The reason these two things are so important to understand is because they provide the foundation for understanding our current struggle with sin. It means, thanks be to God, it doesn't all depend on our ability to get everything right. It encourages us because it reminds us that we have Christ's power and authority and His indwelling Holy Spirit to help us in our weakness. It shows us why the Bible calls us to engage in the fight against sin's continued attempts to influence us. So now we can better address the question of why do we still struggle with sin? And here's the answer. It's really not complicated. Although we are made new in Christ and sin's dominion is broken in our lives, we still live in a fallen, sin-saturated world with an enemy that is still trying to wreck our souls. God has won the war, undoubtedly. But there are still battles to be fought. 17th century theologian John Owen once noted, indwelling sin lives in us in some measure and degree while we are in this world. So with the coming of Christ, the kingdom of God has decisively entered into the world. The kingdom has come. But we live in an in-between time because the kingdom has not come in its fullness. We still are fallen creatures living in a fallen world until the Lord returns. So we still feel sometimes strongly the influence of temptation and sin. And it's no accident, I believe, that the passages I read from Romans 6, which speak about us dying and being raised in union with Christ, comes immediately before today's lesson where St. Paul speaks of his own interior battles against sin. Both are true. Listen to his words again in 21 to 23 of chapter 7. So I find it a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So the struggle is real. But here's what I want you to see in this discussion. That if you struggle against sin, and I assume you do, you are not somehow defective and your faith is not meaningless. Far from it. The fact that you sense this interior struggle is good. If you sensed no struggle, then sin would still have dominion in your life. The fact that you notice that you are in the fight means that you are, in fact, in the fight. This is the charge that is given to us in our baptism. At the conclusion of baptism, we mark the cross on the forehead of the baptized and say this commission. Receive the sign of the cross as a token of your new life in Christ, in which you shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, to fight bravely under his banner against the world, the flesh, and the devil, and to continue as his faithful soldier and servant to the end of your days. So we, we struggle with sin. And we'll continue to struggle with sin because the world, the flesh, and the devil still seek to distract, deceive, and destroy the souls of men. If you, like me, have temptations and fears, and regrets, sins that continue to launch assaults at you, you are not alone. You are not defective. You are not deficient. You're in the battle. 
Next week, I'll talk about ways we can fight temptation and sin. But for now, know this and hear this. The more you walk faithfully with Jesus, the more you grow in your faith, the more you immerse yourself in His Word, the more you approach the communion rail for strength and mercy, the more you sincerely confess your sins in genuine repentance, the more you lock arms with one another in the community of faith, the more battles you will win. You will get better at knowing your weak spots. You will get better in being skilled in this kind of warfare. But also know this, you will not win every battle. Sometimes you'll lose. God knows this. Thank God looks down and goes, oh my word, can you see what he's done now? Our sins don't surprise him. And that is why he's made a way for the believer to be restored. We admit our sins. We confess them to God. We repent from them. And we receive his forgiveness. And then we get back in the fight. Sinclair Ferguson has become one of my favorite modern writers. I've almost decided that if you don't have a Scottish accent, I'm really probably not going to listen a whole lot to the... But if they've got a Scottish accent, I mean, if I had a Scottish accent, we would be like amazing, wouldn't it? Mississippi accent is just like, sorry, that's just what I got. He puts it this way in his book, simply titled The Christian Life, and I'd recommend that book to you. He says, the great mistake many of us make is to look only at our sin and failure, And then to ask a little despairingly, what can I do? But our need is not to do. It is first of all to understand what God has done. To see what he has made us through his son is a man or a woman who has died with Christ to sin's dominion and has been raised to Christ, with Christ to newness of life. So my friends, do not be discouraged that you still struggle with sin. God is with you. He sent his son to deal with your sin. He has made you his child. He will not abandon you, but will see you through all the struggles and temptations of this life. And he will even grow you through them. And one day, sin with all of its effects and pain and misery will not even be a memory to us anymore. The battles will cease, the war will be over, and we will rest with the saints who, like us, fought the good fight of the faith. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.